Hello everyone. Today is Saturday, June the 13th, 2020. My name is Beverly. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you a very interesting dream that I had on May 24th of this year, 2020. All right. I got super lazy during this time and I only wrote down part of the dream and then I got distracted. I wrote, was writing it down when I first woke up and I went downstairs and I never came back and finished writing it down. So I wrote down part of it and I'm going to have to tell you to the best of my ability uh, what the context was with the rest of the dream. So I'll read it. All right. Well, first I'll give you the context. Okay. I was in, ugh, can't remember, some kind of a place like school. Um, and, yep, we were in school and we were taking some kind of tour of a building or some kind of museum. I don't know, but some kind of thing related to our class. So this man was sort of lecturing and sort of just... Um, presenting some exhibit to us because we were moving through the building and we stopped in front of this one guy. Now, this is the best I can remember it, how we got in front of this guy. So this guy, like a, he would have reminded you of a professor or a curator of a museum. He seemed very uh, academic or something. Anyway, very formal and academic. So anyway, he's standing there and he seemed to be like up in in an exhibit. That's why I kind of say it was something like a museum. So it was kind of like how you stop along the walls of something and you push a button and it'll give the um, explanation or presentation of whatever exhibit that you're standing in front of but it was something like that but it wasn't that because he actually was there so it was like we stopped in front of this guy and he told us you know what his thing was what his whatever his little lecture was about so so I'm standing there with some classmates and it was almost as though I were back in school with my with my classmates um, because we had um, like in field experiences where we were off in groups of like seven or eight actually um, working not really working, but working slash learning in the hospital. They call it clinicals. So it almost reminded me of clinicals where it wasn't um, as structured in a classroom type way as you would think of school, but it still was a learning environment. So we're standing in front of this guy. We're, we're going through this, whatever this school or museum exhibit, whatever it was, and we stop in front of this guy for him to do his presentation. And he says this. He starts telling us whatever his spiel was. And he says, Allinger, I didn't know what he, the word was, but I wrote down, I didn't even know how to spell it. I wrote Allinger his. Okay. And I spelled it um, A L A N G E R. Looks like H I S S. And he said, from the Department of Something. I didn't remember what a governmental department he said, but he said he was from of the Department of Something. And then he said um, something about 50 years of over turning society to the credit monopoly. I asked, okay, <laughs> silly me, 
we're standing there and it, it, it seemed like, you know, I even had my books or notes or whatever we had and me and my classmates are all standing there. Now, um, I was standing there as me, myself, as, you know, 52 year old Beverly, not as, you know, young Beverly. So I'm standing there. I was, I was young. It was like I was back in school, but it was like I had my mind that I have now. So I said, um, I said, uh, okay, I asked, how sure are you of that figure? And I, I said it very casually. I said, excuse me, sir, how sure are you of that figure? And, and I also asked, did he have anyone he was quoting? He said he wasn't sure and he didn't have a quote. And, and then I wrote, he then said, and doggone it, I stopped writing and got distracted. And oh, so I'm going to have to recreate that to the best of my ability, in my memory. So he said, so this is how the conversation went. He said, Allinger Hiss from the Department of Something, which I didn't know. I can't. I just couldn't remember. But he said it was from the Department of Something. And he said that this guy was involved in 50 years of overturning society to the credit monopoly, to credit monopoly. I asked, so he, he said that he's given his uh, presentation, his lecture, whatever, and this is just supposed to be like some little peppering of information they present to us and we move on. Nobody was interested in that. This is how education works in America. They present you with these things, with the information, in a context where it is irrelevant to you and to your life at that time. And at also a time of very high stress where um, you have your focus on some other goal. You're in some rigorous educational program where they're constantly throwing quizzes, papers, tests, certifications, this, that, and the other at you. And you are being exposed to this information and you're not looking at it critically. You're not looking at it analytically. You are not looking at this information to integrate it into your worldview. You are simply memorizing what it is they want you to know so you can spit it back out on a test and move on towards your goal. So that's the way they were looking at it. Like, okay, just like, all right, this is just some more junk I got to know. Okay, what would the test question, you know, did I write that down? So, but me, I'm thinking what he said intrigued me. 50 years of overturning society to the credit, to create, no, not to the credit monopoly, to create monopoly. 50 years of overturning society to create monopoly. And this Allinger, Allinger Hiss um, Department of Something. He was from the Department of Something. So I said, I said, excuse me, how sure are you of that figure? I didn't make it seem like, you know, I am a... Um, critic of the American government. I am aware of the earnest plot to, by um, financial forces. People who stand to gain from financial forces being responsible for um, the effort to take over 
the United States to merge it with Russia to think about collectivism, blah, 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 blah. So the, my whole Norman Dodd experience is coming back to me and the what the Lord has shown me about communism. And I'm asking this guy without um, trying to seem like, I'm just trying to seem really casual because I don't want him to clam up because he just seemed like he was part of it. He was down with it. And he just had to tell us about it, but to make it seem like, oh, you know, no big deal. This guy, Alger Hiss, part of this, the Department of Something, and he was um, involved in 50 years of, over, of overturning society to create monopoly, right? So that was supposed to just be some information that we have been exposed to, that we're just going to spit back out on a test, never try to see where it fits into what's happening in our lives, what's happening in our world. That's how they present history to us. Just as little facts, figures, and little snippets here and snippets there to make sure that we never um, integrate those things and that we never consider that those things are what have brought us to where we are right now. And that um, history repeats itself, how relevant those things are, and to see the patterns in history and to see, how would I say, to see the fact that history has a flow. That there's something about what was going on then that could pr project to you where you're going to end up later. You know, I cannot get on I-40 going west and expect to you know, end up on the coast of the Carolinas. I don't know if, if I-40 East goes all the way to the Carolinas, but I can't head west and think that I'm going to somehow end up on the East Coast. Now, it shouldn't surprise me if I end up in uh, Albuquerque. So this is how they don't want us to think about history. They don't want us. They just want it to be garbage that we choose A, B, or C on a test. Maybe some matching. But they don't want you to analyze what has happened so you can see what is happening. So you can see who are the players. So you can't see what is so plainly before your eyes. It's almost like they're just introducing landmines, rabbit holes, and irrelevance so that you will know nothing. And then you have dreams of 401ks dancing in your head so that you don't even care by the time you get out of school. And if you didn't get a 401k, well, then you have a big, great, big, fat account with Sally Mae. And that'll keep your mind occupied. So you never consider what's going on. Which, if you look, it's not hard to discover. But it is so irrelevant to everyone. So irrelevant. So there's the truth movement and then there are the spiritual implications of this truth movement. Because you have the natural and you have the spiritual. Things that we see here in the natural are directed are directed by the things that are happening in the spiritual world. The fact is in the spiritual world uh 
there is a being, a, a being who, like all beings, was created by God. There wasn't anything made that was not created by him. So there's this being, formerly named Lucifer, now known as Satan, the devil, the dragon. And he is the enemy, the serpent, also another name. He is the enemy of God and of human beings and of God's natural creation. The natural physical world that God created which we actually are an amazing creation created a little bit lower than the angels which that being Lucifer now Satan is one we're lower than those higher beings of creation in that we are natural beings mortal flesh and blood an amazement touchable physical matter we are formed from the dust of the earth and given life by the breath of God think about that God blew into us the breath of of life and when we stop breathing we die we die naturally the word for um, air in um, scientific jargon is pneuma like if you people who get um, a hole in their lung or a punctured lung a collapsed lung they're said to have a pneumothorax they have air in their thorax if you have um, a a respiratory sickness in your lungs. You're said to have pneumonia. By the same token, the Spirit of God is called pneuma. Remember when Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, wherever it wants, and um, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and you can't tell from where it's coming or to where it's going. And he compared that to God's spirit, the wind. So what is it about the air that we need to live? for our natural human flesh to live. There are lots of gases in the air, but the one that is of concern to us, of greatest concern to us, because we can, it is, you know, the element of life. You'll die the quickest without this of anything that'll kill you and that's without oxygen you you literally just have moments to live without oxygen it represents 21 percent of the air that you see around you or that you don't see around you when the air gets thick enough we actually can see it When you look on a hot day and you see that kind of looks like water, it's 
There are times when you can see the air. The reason why things disappear when you go off in the, in the distance, they seem to go over the horizon, as they would say, is partly influenced by how thick and what is in the air. How much humidity is in the air? You know, smog, gases with with color. Other, not necessarily gas has a color, but the um, particles that may be floating in the air. So those things can can influence how quickly something seems to disappear into the distance. You hear about on a on the weather forecast, you'll hear things like the visibility, how far into the distance toward the horizon can you see on that particular day, is also influenced by just the limits of the human eye to bring things that are far in distance from us back to our eyes. So there is a limit to the capability of the visual acuity of a human being. Glasses, um, zoom lenses, telescopes, stuff like that, improve that. Which is one of the biggest reasons why common sense has convinced so many people that the earth actually is and all you know is flat. Because while on the one hand they're telling us the things when you watch the ocean, which is the flattest thing, because if you put water in a glass, it's always gonna, even if you tip the glass this way, the water's gonna be level. The water's gonna be parallel to the to the foundation of the world. Whatever God founded the world upon is level. And water will always be level with that foundation. Therefore, the water will always be flat. Until you get over to the, to the body of land that connects, that is connected by that body of water. If you could somehow see that far, you would be able to look straight over it. Only thing that might block your sight is some waves. But if that water were perfectly calm, you'd be able to see it. Um, so anyway, I forget where I was going for. Because everything is so connected. Everything is so connected. And that's one thing education is is busy trying to make sure that we don't ever do. That life just seems like this big collection of random facts, coincidences that don't make any sense, and that and the best we can do is is gather up a little bit of money and eat, drink, and be merry because we're gonna die, or maybe we won't because. Uh, if we trust our government and put enough money into science, they can find a way for us to live. Anyway, so the air. Just like things float in water, things can float in air. There's something called heavy water.
So heavy water is a form of water that contains a larger than normal amount of, of the hydrogen isotope uh, deuterium. Deuter deuteridium. No, deuterium, deuterium. Okay. So deuterium is one of the two stable isotopes of hydrogen. The nucleus of a deuteridium, no, a deuterium atom called the deuterion contains one proton and one neutron, whereas the far most common protein has no neutrons in the nucleus. Deuterid deuterium <laughs> has a natural abundance in Earth's oceans of about one atom. Mm -mm, there you go. But it won't come back. It won't come back. Oh, there it is. Of about one atom in 6,420. So, 2H, or D, also known as heavy hydrogen rather than common hydrogen 1 isotope, called proteum, that makes up most of the hydrogen in normal water. The presence of deuterium... <laughs> gives water different nuclear properties and the increase of mass gives it slightly different physical and chemical properties when compared to normal water. So you know how water is made up of H2O, which is two hydrogens and one of those precious oxygen molecules. So this heavy water is also H2O, but instead of being the normal and most common form of hydrogen, this is made up of a slightly different hydrogen, which they it's still hydrogen because it has um, one electron. So hydrogen is the chemical element with this symbol H and atomic number 1. With the standard atomic weight of 1.008 hydrogen is the lightest element in the periodic table. Hydrogen is the most abundant chemical substance con um, constituting around 75% Sorry, this is taking so long. I didn't know about all this or I would have looked it up beforehand. Okay. So there's carbon hydrogen, hydrogen one, and then there's another form of hydrogen, which two forms of the same element are called isotopes. So, and oh, and then there's even another one, but we're not going to go there. So, the other form is called uh, deuterium. Okay, so deuterium can also form in a two to one combination with oxygen to form water. But this water that it forms has different properties than the normal water and the most abundant form of water that we we're dealing with, that we're drinking it and doing all this other stuff with it. So let's see how heavy water is different. So we don't need to get any more into the chemistry of it. It's fine. So the chemical formula is 2H2O, but not hydrogen peroxide. This is a superscript 2, not a coefficient 2. Superscript 2. So the second form of hydrogen 
to O. Um, its appearance is a colorless liquid. It is odorless. That's the same as water. The density is a 1.107 grams per milliliter. Now, I believe that regular water has a density of just simply one by definition. So that's how they formed, I think, like the gram and the centimeter and all that stuff. That's how they defined the unit of weight that we know as a gram, by the weight of a certain volume of regular water. So this water is denser, thicker, however you want to say it, than regular water. All right. So its boiling point is also slightly higher. Regular water boils at 212 degrees and this boils at 214 and a half degrees. All right, interesting. All right, and one of the common characteristics of any substance that they'll name to kind of give you an idea of its character would say, is it soluble in water? Will it dissolve in water? Because water's like the universal solvent, I think. I think I remember that. So it doesn't dissolve in water, but it mixes perfectly and evenly with water because they're very close in what they are. Okay? Ooh. So it says the additional neutron, neutron makes a um, deuterium atom roughly twice as heavy as a Proteum atom. Now remember, proteum is the regular form of hydrogen that we think about. Hydrogen one. Okay, a molecule of, he that doesn't mean water, that the heavy water is twice as heavy as regular water because the oxygen provides most of the weight of water. So, the fact that the two hydrogens that are there are heavier than the normal hydrogens that are there is, is not making that big of a difference because oxygen is so much of the weight of water. It is thicker, but not twice as thick. Okay, so a molecule of heavy water has two, I'm tired of saying this word, deuterium deuterium atoms in place of the two proteum atoms of ordinary light water. The weight of heavy water molecule, however, is not substantially different from that of a normal water molecule because about 89% of the molecular weight of water comes from the single oxygen atom rather than the two hydrogen atoms. Okay, so that's basically what I just said. The, the colloquial term heavy water refers to a higher enriched water mixture that contains mostly deuterium, deuterium oxide. But also some hydrogen deuterium oxide and a smaller amount of ordinary hydrogen oxide. Now, Hydrogen oxide is just plain old water, H2O. So that, that deuterium oxide is also H2O, but it's referring to that second isotope, which forms with water, heavy water. Okay. 
And then so they're saying that all three of these types of water, all three of these molecules will be present if you have a sample of heavy water. You're going to have a small amount of regular water molecules in there. You're going to have some water molecules that are a mixture of the two and then you're going to have some pure deuterium oxide molecules. For instance, the heavy water used in can-do reactors, what is a can-do reactor? Okay, the can-do is a Canadian pressurized heavy water reactor designed design used to generate electrical power. The acronym refers to its deuterium oxide moderator and its use of uranium fuel. Can-do reactors were first developed in the late 1950s and 60s. Ooh, that's interesting. Because this is the same period of time where Allinger, Allen, Allinger Hiss was. Okay. I can see this is going to be a very roundabout story, but I'm going to get there. All right. Ooh. So... The heavy water used in can-do reactors is 99.75 enriched by hydrogen atom fraction, meaning that 99.75% of the hydrogen atoms are of the heavy type. For comparison, ordinary water, the ordinary water used for a deuterium standard, contains only about 156 deuterium atoms per million hydrogen atoms, meaning that only 0.016156% of the hydrogen atoms are of the heavy type. Heavy water is not radioactive. In its pure form, it has a density of about 11% greater than water, but is otherwise physically and chemically similar. Nevertheless, the various differences in deuterium containing water, especially affecting the biological properties, are larger than any other commonly occurring isotope substitute compound because Deuterium is unique among heavy, stable isotopes in being twice as heavy as the lightest isotope. This difference increases the strength of water's hydrogen-oxygen bonds, and this, in turn, is enough to cause differences that are important in some biochemical reactions. The human body naturally contains deuterium equivalent to about 5 grams of heavy water, which is harmless. Hmm. So 5 grams of the 70% of water that we are is heavy water, which is harmless. When a large fraction of water greater than 50% in higher organisms is replaced by heavy water, the result is cell dysfunction and death. Heavy water was first produced in 1932, a few months after the discovery of deuterium. With the discovery of nuclear fission in the late 19 in late 1938 oh guys this is getting interesting what's getting interesting are these dates and this leading up to the development of the bomb that 
that was used in Japan to end World War II in 1945. The ending of World War II in 1945 was the trigger event for the creation and acceptance of the of the United Nations. Now it's interesting that they discovered nuclear fission in 1938 and then they decided they wanted to go to world war again. I believe the world war was officially started, I, I want to say 1939. So a year later, they discover this, you know, diabolical thing here. And immediately, what are they going to do? Of course, they're going to weaponize it. How can I use this to do my favorite thing? Okay. So heavy water was first produced in 1932. A few months after the discovery of deuterium, with the discovery of nuclear fission in late 1938 and the need for a neutron moderator that captured few neutrons, heavy water became a component of the early nuclear energy research, of early nuclear energy research. Since then, Heavy water has been a, an essential compound in some types of reactors. Both those that generate power and those designed to produce isotopes for nuclear weapons. Mm. So in 1932, so this deuterium is very, very rare in nature, as you just heard. Ordinary water is only going to contain one hundredth of a percent of these unusually heavy hydrogen atoms. So when they f get together with oxygen, they form heavy water. So less than, than um, two one hundredths of a percent of water molecules will be heavy water so it will have it'll be perfectly harmless have absolutely no effect on the body because it's just literally nothing I mean it's almost nothing so and what we read earlier that was 156 heavy water molecule heavy water molecules per 1 million 150 in a million. Nothing. All right. So in 1932, they learned how to take this very rare molecule and make it abundant. And of course, what do they do with it? Let's figure out how to turn it into a weapon. Now, I would dare say most human beings don't even know about this, don't even know that there are different types of water. Now, we have heard, or this is what they tell us, that the, in the upper levels of our atmosphere, there is a form of oxygen that instead of being O2 is O3. Instead of being two oxygen molecules bonded together to make 
the O2, instead of two oxygen atoms bonded together to make the oxygen molecule that we breathe, these are three atoms joined in one molecule and they call it ozone. And supposedly this is protective and probably nonsense, but I'm sure ozone does exist. Ozone being the form of oxygen that has three atoms of, of oxygen rather than two, two atoms. Oxygen is what is known as a diatomic molecule. So the molecule of oxygen is what we breathe. We don't breathe the individual atoms of, of oxygen. The form of oxygen that the body wants is two oxygen atoms joined very stably together. This is what we breathe. This is what our body uses to create the energy that is essential for our cells to live literally minute to minute. We have to constantly have, an, have oxygen. And there is no, nothing that can substitute for it. Nothing at all. We must have oxygen. And the percentage that oxygen needs to be present at is 21%. When you get less than 21%, people can still survive. The percentage of, of all of the molecules that are in the air, because the air has a substance. Air is actually considered a form of liquid. It is just not as dense as what we think of as a liquid, which would be the water. So, meaning if I take the same volume of air and say I take a cube like this and I fill it with air and I put it somewhere and I somehow can have it contained and I know what the container weighs and I can weigh that air. And then I can have the weight for that and then I can compare that weight to the same size container, the same volume of water. So obviously which one's gonna weigh more? If I have the same size container of water and the same size, size container of air, it's, uh, there's going to be a difference in what they weigh, obviously. So because of those differences in what things weigh, that's what floats in what. So the air is on top of the water because the air is less dense than the water meaning that the same volume of air weighs less than its counterpart in water. So what we just learned about heavy water, because of the differences in the hydrogen atom that is present in the water molecule, heavy water has a greater density than ordinary water. So you would find all your heavy water would go, it would be lower. And then you have your lighter water, then you're going to have air, and then you're going to have your heaviest air. You would think your heaviest air would be at the bottom. So it doesn't really make sense that the ozone would be at the top. But I have to, um, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. But as we know, there are a lot of facts that have been misinterpreted for us in order to um, hide the fact that the earth is flat. And then they take advantage of the fact that Who's going up there? Like I said, we got 401ks and Sally Mae accounts to attend to. So nobody can be worrying about what's at the top of the sky. So anyway, we are going to try to piece together what we can from this. I have not ever looked into this. So we're discovering this together and see where, where the Lord is taking me. So you kind of see the process of how I get into researching things. 
It's not just that I'm off down rabbit holes. I refuse to go down rabbit holes. I know it's a trap. I know it's a trick from the devil. My focus must be Jesus. But the Lord leads me into what to look into. When I started talking about communism, it was not because I was watching communist YouTube videos. No, I was just like everybody else, clueless about communism because we haven't been told anything about communism in a real way, in a real relevant way in the process of our education. All right, so 1932, they figured out how to make this heavy hydrogen so they can greatly, so they can actually create heavy water, which ordinarily is ex is extremely rare as a natural occurrence. So with this discovery of this du deuterium, deuterium, now you know, dut, that, that prefix on there, dut, it means two in, in a bunch of languages. So this is two. All it is is hydrogen two. They make, even they make the language of science seem so complicated. Like, oh, my head is spinning. But it's really not. It's really very simple. All right. So they want you to be exposed to just enough of it to feel like you don't know anything and to get intimidated when everybody, when anybody starts throwing jargon out at you. So then in 1938, they discover nuclear fission and this heavy water becomes very useful in this process for nuclear fission. This is what we're learning here. So the need for a new neutron moderator that captured few new neurons, heavy water became a component of early nuclear, nuclear energy research. Since then, Heavy water has been an essential component in some types of reactors, both those that generate power and those that and those designed to produce isotopes for nuclear weapons. These heavy water reactors have the advantage of being able to run on natural uranium without using graphite moderators that pose radiological and dust explosion hazards in the decommissioning phase. Okay, so a nuclear power plant or a nuclear weapons uh, manufacturing facility, in using these dangerous elements, um, when it comes time to shut this plant down, they have less hazardous stuff to deal with if they use heavy water instead of um, graphite. So they're able to use a different type of uranium to make that makes it less dangerous. Okay, most modern reactors use enriched uranium with ordinary water as the moderator. So I guess natural uranium is less radioactive than enriched uranium. So be more stable. So there's advantages to using heavy water for the nuclear power weaponry production process. All right. Ooh, so they learned how to make all kind of stuff. Hmm, ooh, this is shameful. And so this heavy water, okay, saw something that caught my eye. This heavy water would be completely indistinguishable from regular water. It looks and behaves in a very similar way. 
and it could mix with it without you really, you wouldn't know at all that it was mixed in there. But, but as we said, as we read earlier, when it's mixed in high, when it is present in high concentrations, is deadly. Hmm, interesting. So, and then here's heavy oxygen water. Water enriched with the heavier oxygen isotopes, O17 and O18, is also commercially available. Now they're playing with the oxygen in the water. So oxygen normally contains 16 protons, electrons, and neutrons. So if you're going to have a different isotopes, which the most stable one and the most common one is going to be the one you have the most and the one that is biologically friendly, which is O16. So here they have O17 and O18. See, they can force that extra, I guess it's a neutron. They can force that extra neutron into these regular oxygen atoms. And then when you do that, this the substance that the substances that that atom would go on to normally form, like water or some air that you would breathe, are now um, are going to now have different properties that instead of being biologically friendly are are harmful. It's kind of like when they alter the chemical structure of fats. You know, everybody's always talking about trans fats, trans fats. You take a fat that normally is a liquid at room temperature and you move around the way the, um, the atoms that make up that molecule are bonded together and all of a sudden it becomes a solid at room temperature. And because it is no longer a normal natural substance, it's dangerous. So just this is kind of like GMO food, GMO water, except water and air don't have uh, genetic properties like, like we consider life, like our genes and our DNA. By the way, a long time ago, God told me when they get finished... <laughs> When they, once they analyze DNA and really break down what it is, it's going to, when they decode the genome, the human genome, which is the DNA, it's going to say God. So I'd like to see the look on their face when they see that. So. So this heavy oxygen water, where they make heavy water by using a different form of oxygen instead of by using a different form of the hydrogen, for use as a non-radioactive isotope tracer, it is heavy water as it is denser than normal water, H2O, but O form type 18 is approximately as dense as the other heavy water that we're used to. And, okay, but it's rarely called heavy water because it doesn't contain that traditional heavy hydrogen. It's more expensive than the regular heavy water due to a difficult separation. Oh, and that's this is what made me pause before. It says, oh, look at this here. This heavy water, H2O18,
is also used for production of fluorine 18 for radio pharmaceuticals and for radio trans radio tracers and for position emission tomography PET scans hmm wow and you, you see why my antenna went up because fluorine and we all hear about why is fluorine fluoride so dangerous why is fluoride so dangerous why is fluoride so dangerous interesting I don't know but I'm just saying I'm seeing that so so the freezing point Wow regular water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit this heavy water has a higher freezing point so light water isn't gonna freeze until it's 32 degrees but this heavy water will freeze at almost 39 degrees so if you were to take some heavy water and just put it in your refrigerator. Our refrigerator is on like 70, is on like 37%. It would freeze in the refrigerator. Interesting. Mm. Like I said earlier, the boiling point is higher as well. Hmm. Temperature of maximum density. Significantly more. So let's think about that. The temperature at which this has maximum density. That would be a cold temperature. Mm. So that would be like ice. The colder a liquid gets it's um, compressing same thing with a gas the colder a liquid gets it's gonna be taking up less room so remember when I said if I had a little box full of air and a little box full of water the same size then um, that air is going to weigh much, 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 much less. But if I take air and make it cold, apply cold to it or take heat away from it, that's what they say technically is happening. I don't know if that's true, but whatever. So if I'm, I, I believe that's true. So if I'm taking heat away from the, the air that I have trapped in this thing, the colder it gets, it's going to shrink. The colder it gets, it's going to take up less space. And if this is a completely sealed container and I get it really, really cold, that's interesting. If I take it a closed sealed container and I heat it up, then that same amount of air is going to want to get bigger. Which is why you're not supposed to burn um, hairspray cans or any type of aerosol container because there's gas trapped inside that container. And when it gets hot, that gas starts to expand and take up a bigger volume. Eventually, you get it so hot that it's going to escape by exploding that thing. So when you, if you people burn trash, they already know not to burn aerosol cans. Because when you burn them, they're going to explode. So, yeah. So if you take water 
same size water, heavy water, light water. And I, I put the heavy water in the same size container as I put the light water. This water will weigh less than the heavy water. Then if I start making, making them cold, then um, the temperature, just like the um, air, because air and liquids behave in all the exact same ways, except for the fact that air is not compressible. Air um, takes on the shape of its container, but it does, does not fill the volume of the container the way a gas does. Yeah. A gas will the if I take this container and take all the water out of it um as long as I have an amount of gas in here the pressure of which will and at a certain temperature will not explode this thing it however much air I put in here It'll take up the whole space. They'll, the air molecules will just fill up the whole space. And if they have less room, then they'll get closer together. But the more room you give them, the more room they'll take up. It's just like how you ever remember in school when they told us, stretch our arms out and spread out because we're about to, you know, do our jumping jacks in gym. I don't know if young people will remember that. I don't know. They did that still. So anyway, so by the same token, when this water gets cold, it shrinks a little bit. It's going to not shrinks. It um, solidifies. And it for actually water gets a little bit bigger when it forms its crystal, crystal structures, which is why when you freeze a pop, it, it can bust the can. Because it gets, when it forms into its little structures, it expands a little bit. There's a little bit more space in between each of the um, molecules when you freeze it. So that's why pop cans bust. It's not the carbonation. Any, anything, um, even plain water, if you put this in the freezer and freeze it, when you come back, like the bottom will be bulged out and it'll, it'll rock on the countertop because it just got just a little bit bigger because it when it freezes it has to stack up in its crystal form. All right. So the maximum density of heavy water is achieved at a higher temperature than the maximum density of regular water. So for regular water, it's about four degrees Celsius. Hmm. And then this one is a higher temperature. That's interesting. Dynamic viscosity is greater, so it's thicker than regular water. It actually, if you could see the way you pour it, it would be thicker. Not as thick like compared syrup to water, but it would be a little bit thicker. You know how alcohol, you can tell it's more runny than regular water. So this heavy water would be a little thicker. Hmm. Uh, heat of vaporization. When does it, hmm, interesting. When does it turn into a vapor? Refractive index. I don't know what that means. So effects on biological systems. This is what we care about. Oh, they did some experiments on animals too. That ought to be interesting. Different isotopes of chemical element, elements have slightly different chemical behaviors. But for most elements, the differences are far too small to have biological effects.
For most elements, the differences are far too small to have biological effects. In the case of hydrogen, larger differences in chemical properties among proteum, light hydrogen, and deuterium, and triturium occurs because chemical bond energy depends on the reduced mass of the nucleus hydrogen system. Don't worry about that part. This is altered in heavy hydrogen compounds. Hydrogen deuterium oxide, which is heavy water, is the most common species. Hydrogen deuterium which is heavy, heavy water, which is, uh, this is a mix of regular water and heavy water, which could be any sort of a mix. More than for heavy isotope substitutions involving other chemical elements. This is altered in heavy hydrogen compounds more than for heavy isotope substances involving other chemical elements. So the reason why so it's saying that isotopes of different elements um, are common. You don't always have the same isotope. It could be mixed in there. But for the most part, it doesn't make any difference biologically when you have a slightly different form of an, of an atom mixing in a, in a molecular compound that is um, going to be doing things actively in your body biologically. But in the case of hydrogen with heavy water, that is different. And the reason is, is because hydrogen being the lightest element, having a, an atomic number of just one, Increasing that by even one doubles the effect. So if you're making, in the case of other isotopes where you may have an atomic number of, you know, 20, I don't know which element has 20 as its atomic number, but if you did take the element that has the atomic number of 20, and then you take an isotope that increases it by just one neutron or neuron in the nucleus, it's not going to make that big of a difference. It's only one twentieth heavier. But with hydrogen, it's twice as heavy, even with this small little difference of just one additional new neutron. Is it neutrons? Yes, neutron. I might have said neuron. That's a brain cell. Oh boy, God is just, he's in everything. He's everywhere. He's connected to everything. He is unimaginable. The devil is absolutely no match for him. The devil, that's why the devil has to control our focus because, um, and he's got to keep us in this narrow band of depravity called sin in order to influence us. Because if we were to focus on the vastness and the wonder of God and to ponder the beauty of his creation, we wouldn't even pay attention to the little garbage that the devil is trying to distract us with. That's why if you pray and read your Bible and fast so that the spirit is able to reach you. God is always speaking, but we are so messed up and we are so earthly focused and um, so busy stimulating our flesh and living in our flesh because the devil is constantly tempting us in our flesh that we just are not tuned in. We're just not in a position to hear. So, speaking of um, neurons, so these are neutrons, which 
refer to the atoms and the isotopes and all that stuff. But neurons are brain cells. And God told me one time, when I was, when he was still trying to get me to wrap my head around what communism is. And then he said, how is communism like a forest? And how is the brain like a forest? Well, I had to do some research. I don't know. Or he said, it is like it. And so I had to think, okay, how is communism like the brain? And how is the brain like a forest? So what I found out was, I, you know, do a little search. And I found out it's because the neurons, which are the cells of the brain, are actually similar in structure to trees. As a matter of fact, let's see, neuron okay, structure. Structure of the neuron. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right. So we have the brain, the body. How is this all relevant to God? Somebody might be asking. It's the body. This is what the devil has been hiding from you by introducing these things to you, having you think you're educated. But introducing them to you in such a haphazard, unorganized, irrelevant way, full of lies of um, evolution and millions and billions of years, instead of God saying, let there be light. Because he wants you, he wants to hide the wonder of the fact that we are created by a spirit and that not only are we a natural creation but we are also spirit and he doesn't want us to operate in the spirit or to think on the things of the spirit he wants to keep us stuck in our flesh because flesh is the dwelling place of sin in your flesh and in my flesh there dwells no good thing at all. all right. So how is communism like the brain and how is the brain like the forest? Okay. The anatomy of the neuron. Okay. The dendrites. It's literally shaped like a neuron is literally shaped like a little tree. It has a trunk that's called the axion. And then it has the axion terminal, which is looks like the roots. And then you have the top of it, which is called the body or soma, which literally just means body. And it's all over science. And whenever you see soma, it means body. All over science, across many um, fields of study, soma. And then on the ends of the body, you have a trunk, you have roots, and then you have these things called the dendrites, which are branches. So you have the body and, and these little things that just branch off from there. So that's how the brain is like a forest because it's made up of all of these little trees. And these trees, through their roots and branches and the little connections or the little spaces between them, which are called synapses, where electrical impulses, thoughts, everything that we are, 
jump from neutron or neuron, sorry, from neuron to neuron. As um, I want to think, I want to say they're like called uh, action potentials, which is an electrical impulse that just goes through the brain, an electrical stimulus. And one, one neutron, one neuron doesn't do anything by itself. It's when they fire in a coordinated way that something can get done, that something can go from a thought to an action. From a thought to do something into a physical manifestation. Isn't that interesting? I think I want a sip of my water. From that thought and my will, I can command my hand to go over here and grab this water, take a sip, and then there are certain things that are automatic. I don't have to think how to swallow. I don't have to tell the water where to go. I don't have to tell my throat what to do to squeeze the water down. I don't have to tell my intestine or anything where to send that water. It's going to go where it's needed in the body. And then my physical body can communicate with my brain to make me thirsty so it can get what it needs. So the brain consists of these little trees. Listen to this. This is from This is from Home Biomedical Sciences General Trees of the Brain Roots of the Mind. Hmm. This is something by MIT Press. Isn't that interesting? Look, look, look at God. Now, somebody might say, Beverly makes these, these God-awful long videos. But if you just want to spend time in the mind of God, if you go and sit in front of your television and let the devil stream literal madness to you, in the form of the Jewish media. Why not just listen to the stream of the flow of the Holy Spirit to try to get you to understand everything that God has done since Adam and Eve ate the fruit was to try and get us to understand. Because if you understood sin, if we fully understood sin, we'd never commit it. And by the time all of this is all over and we see everything that's playing out, this time right here that we're living through, it has a purpose. There's a purpose to everything under heaven. The purpose is to get us to understand the filth, the destruction, and the devastation of when people reject God as we once did. And we are learning every day the bitter, horrible levels that people can sink to when they refuse to get joined up with the mind of the Spirit. When we refuse the mind of Christ. We're going to miss those messages that are sent from tree to tree.
you're going to miss those messages that are sent from tree to tree. Because there's a, there's a space. The, um, the little trees of the brain, the dendrites, the, the, the um, neurons are not actually connected. There's a little space between them called a synapse. And the impulse has to jump from cell to cell. And it all happens in an instant. It, it all happens seemingly in a portion of time so small that it can't be measured by us. They talk about nanoseconds and all that stuff. Yeah, right. It's basically instant. imperceptible to us so that if you're not healthy that is not sick with sin and if you're not close enough the signal won't get to you And then you have things going wrong. If that cell is damaged, it's not transmitting those impulses. It can be cut, it can become cut off from the impulses. Then you have paralytics and cripples, those are the things that happen when you have a stroke. Or if you get an accident that severs your, your spinal cord. So if you have a stroke and some, some cells, some of those neurons die, they're no longer participating in the process of getting the signals to the brain, getting the signal that I need to do something to the next, to the next neuron. And so it can make it where it won't happen. And Paul talks about the whole body being fitly joined together. How I'm not going to be upset because I'm not the eye. I'm not going to be the ear and be upset because I'm not the eye. Because if I'm the eye, if I'm the ear and I'm trying to be the eye, then the body can't hear. It's amazing. So imagine how I don't even know what to do with this stuff. When God tells me the brain is like a forest and communism is like the human brain, it is the devil hijacking through the flesh the process that God placed in us to keep us close to him, to keep us close and in harmony with each other. And the devil trying to tell people that they can, through the flesh, without the spirit, which is God, and without the truth, which is the word, Jesus, the gospel, that we can, without those things, come together as fellow citizens of the earth. He's trying to hijack our minds. And he's trying to, through his devilish ways that work through your flesh, Send messages from person to person. Can send hate and anger. You ever worked at a place that had an atmosphere of bullying? Because the boss was a big bully? And they set the tone 
They decide what messages get through and which ones get blocked, like YouTube. How the media, how Facebook chooses what videos people are seeing. The black people, they show them all these instances of violence and show them all this um, back to Africa pro-black propaganda and all this injustice and they're constantly feeding them a diet of um, pain and anguish and, and outrage and belittling of, of having been former slaves, having been the children of former slaves. The children of the children of the children of former slaves. And these constant assaults to their dignity make them more likely to try to puff up with pride. There's no need to be proud if you don't feel like you have anything to prove. And they spread all this touchiness. So something happens in the neurons of the brain called the action potential. Nothing will happen until you reach the action potential. A stimulus cannot pass to the next neuron unless it is of a certain energy. It has to reach a certain power point. And then once that happens, it's going to sort of hijack that neuron. The neuron has no choice but to fire. People are getting triggered. You trigger that neuron. And then the strength of that triggering passes on to the next neuron. And the ultimate form of this and the most negative form of this is what's known as a seizure. Where your brain has literally just gone electrically haywire where this powerful stimulus has is just just firing all through your brain we as a race of beings humans living on the earth right now are literally sitting on a powder keg And the media, Obama, Trump, are literally just throwing sparks everywhere. And then this guy, they found the perfect video. They found the perfect man. to trigger it all, to set it off. But still, it, it's not a seizure yet, but it will be. These protests are going to be violent. Not just looting, physical violence, people to people. And when that happens, that is going to be the excuse. That is going to be the excuse. Now, between that and this mysterious, ever-changing, 
little understood, but oh so deadly, new phenomenon, formerly known as the common cold. Now between that and the common cold, we have now entered one world government, total tyranny, communism, where everybody is of one mind. The Lord told me that the mark of the beast would make everyone the same. How do you make everyone the same? You hijack their brains. Neurons do not act independently. All they do is pass on the signal that they receive. They only pass on electrical signals. That's all they do. That's all they do. That's why sin is our default. Sin is automatic. Because we're just floating in a stream of sin. Iniquity abounds. David was begging the Lord for mercy, saying, Lord, I was born in sin. I was shaped in iniquity. My mother conceived me in sin. This is our default. Paul said, oh, goodness. Paul said, what I want to do, that I can't do. And what I don't want to do, that's the thing I'm always doing. Why? Because the brain responds to things under its awareness and out of its control. My will is to pick up this cup and I can do it. But something can come and interfere with my will, like pain. You know, maybe I got some nerve pain. Maybe I have carpal tunnel. I would like to drink from that cup. But maybe your hand isn't working and you can't reach for it. Maybe someone's had a stroke and the right side of their body is paralyzed. So this is how the devil works in our flesh to hinder our will. Which, why it, which is why it is so important what we are under the influence of. You, you've heard people in all, all kinds of uh, religious circles say, guard your gates. Guard the entrance ways to your mind. Guard the entrance ways to your mind. Because your mind can be hijacked. It's called Mind control. We see our friends and loved ones all up under it. They're literally no longer thinking for themselves. They're only reacting. And they think these thoughts are their own. And they're being triggered. And the only reason why we're not thinking the exact same way is the word of God and the Spirit of God coming in and putting a different impulse into our brain, making us one with the body and the mind of Jesus Christ. That's why we escaped. Our thinking was not corrupted to the point where we couldn't be reached. But we're going to have to abide. We're going to have to abide. So who was Allinger Hiss? I looked him up. He was a member of the State Department. And in 1948, I believe, he was investigated for treason and accused of cooperating with the Russian government to overthrow 
and not to overthrow in a war type way, but in the way of the silent insurrection that the esteemed Norman Dodd spoke to us about. Remember I made a video about Norman Dodd? I'll link it, but watch his video and see if it makes a little bit more sense. Our brains are hijacked by the things of the flesh. Love of the world, love of money. Irrelevant and harmful impulses start going through our brains. And they pass from person to person because we're like a forest. We as a people are like a forest. We're influenced by the people around us. That's why your leaders can cause you to sin. Someone with a heavy uh, conviction or the ability to speak as though they are heavily convicted by something. Deceivers, liars, can come and imitate a true and powerful statement. They can make a lie seem like the truth. And because of the force, they can create that action potential that triggers one neuron and spreads it around. People read books about it. It's called witchcraft. How to win friends and influence people. Things to say, certain ways to look at them, certain choice words, flattery, all kinds of things that work on people. A touch in a certain way. Painting your eyelids, a little cleavage. Giving the impression that you like somebody a little bit more than what you really do. All these things can increase a stimuli that we ought to ignore. And hijack your will. If you want to reprogram your brain with the proper signals, we have to wash in the word. We have to wash our minds in the word. We have to get the mind of Christ, which is connected to the spirit of God. And what you're trying to do will just flow. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So this guy, Alger Hiss, he was involved in creating what Norman Dodd was investigating. The fact that there were elements in the government, un-American elements, that were trying to subvert the U.S. government since the turn of the century. Since the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. The 1900s. and to orient our government away from the principles that we have had, individualism, um, capitalism, which you could argue about what capitalism is, if it's actually free or not, um, democratic processes, freedoms, small government, individual responsibility, um, little oversight by the government, states' rights, over into this idea of collectivism, of joining up together, of being one, that man can be trusted. Instead of being that brain cell that guards yourself. I'm, I'm not going to just receive every impulse that someone tries to send my way. I have to choose my company wisely 
because they talk Corona crap all day. And they love Obama. I talked to a woman today. I asked her because I knew she'd I knew what she'd say. I was talking to another lady. And um and I was telling her, you know, I already told you that they hate Trump. They hate Trump because they're black and they're watching MSNBC, I don't know. I don't know, whatever this whatever this programming is that's going out and hitting their brains and bouncing all over the place in their brain, got them having a seizure, pass the seizure to the next person. They all having this common seizure where they can't think straight or for themselves. And they hate Trump. It's so easy. Everything's Trump. Everything is Trump. And I, trust me, Trump is no good. Trump reads whatever piece of propagandist trash they put in front of his face. He's betrayed you. He never was for you. He was put there to trick you. But it's easy for them to believe that. What you say about Obama? That's how they do. That's how they, that's what they'll say. What you say about Obama? What you say about Martin Luther King? Because the common delusion is that he's he's a good man. They ignore his actual presidency. That the country was a mess in 2016. They create they created this false legacy. I made a video about that, I think back in 2016, that they were going to begin to work on Obama's false legacy, that he had been this marvelous president when everybody knows that he wasn't, that he did absolutely diddly squat for black people while he was president. He was the senator from Chicago, for goodness sake. The place where black boys are blowing each other's heads off until today. You don't think he could have gone in there as a father figure? As a someone they could look up to? To gather them into something productive by actually putting his hand to the plow while he was the senator for the state, while he was a senator for the state of Illinois? You don't think he could have done that? He didn't even try. Because he don't care nothing about y'all. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what country you're from. He cares nothing for anything. Except for himself. I will exalt myself above everything, even God, he says. Because he's embodied with his father, the devil. So I'm talking to the lady and I'm telling her she's believing everything, you know, everything negative about Trump. She can believe that. And I said, yeah, you know, Trump is um, he's here to do this here. He's here to do this here. When they turn that 5G on. They're going to start playing with that oxygen molecule. Remember how I started talking about the pneuma, the air, the O2? The only element, the only molecule that you will die within minutes if, you, if you're cut off from it. Yeah, that spirit. You can't live without it. There's no substitute for it. You can't live without it. That's how God is. We can't live without him. We can't live without him. You seem to be alive, but you're dead on your feet. There's no hope. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No, I am the life. There's no life without air. There are many things that there are no life without, but air will kill you quicker than anything, the lack of air. So she believed all that. I'm telling her when they turned the 5G on, she didn't really believe it. I don't know if she did or not. But when they turned the 5G on, because she's all masked up and a hand sanitizer. 
I mean, they got a new American citizen. Her name is Hannah Sanitizer. And she's resident in all these homes. Don't leave home without her. So I told her, forget 5G, America's under judgment. I mean, forget uh, co Corona. What's going to happen when they turn? I didn't even get to the part about how in the common denominator between those sicknesses that you saw in China and that out those outbreaks were places where this new 5G wavelength was formed, was, was activated. And there's something about it that affects the oxygen that makes it unable to oxygenate the body. It somehow ties up the oxygen molecule in a way where we can't use it. We can't use it. And it could be something that's a temporary thing where you came in contact with some signal that was affecting the air that was around you. It could be your phone or your very nearest cell tower or something. And what happens is the people panic. scary when you can't breathe so they end up going to the hospital and then they have them sign a paper you know if, if we don't intubate you right away you're going to deteriorate very quickly and you're going to die okay okay and as soon as they have to intubate you, you you can't intubate an awake person because they are going to you you cannot it's unnatural to have air forced into your lungs People fight it. So they have to paralyze you and, and sedate you. So then they're telling people, oh, they're, um, so and so's dad is in a coma because he got COVID. No, he's not in a coma. He's drugged. So he won't fight his ventilator. And then the pressure, which is called the peep and the pip, the peak inspiratory pressure and the peak expiratory pressure. I need my brother from uh, the power is the people because he's a respiratory therapist and he could explain it probably better than me how these ventilators work. No doubt he could explain it better than me how these ventilators work and how they th these people who are essentially having some sort of a, a respiratory decompensation which they may or may not have recovered from, they're definitely not going to recover from it now because you threw them on a ventilator when they didn't need to be on one or you watched them get to the point where they needed to be on the ventilator because you didn't help them breathe when they came in having trouble catching their breath, which is nothing new. If you go back through medical records, you'll find what was the chief complaint on every admission, there's a chief complaint. When they go into the ER, chief complaint, shortness of breath. It's extremely common. When people go into the hospital, they may be saying, I'm having chest pain, shortness of breath. They're the symptoms of so many things. Anemia, which is also very common from our trashy diet. So anyway, they throw you on the ventilator, destroy your lungs with pressure. Once you're asleep and put on all these paralytics and sedative drugs, then you have to have these invasive uh, lines, invasive IVs. By invasive, I don't mean the kind they put in your hand when you went into the hospital. or so I'm talking about something that goes in a central vein. which run straight to your heart, which run the risk of blood clots, infections, 
you're on the ventilator. There's a thing called VAP, ventilator acquired or ventilator, I think it's ventilator acquired pneumonia. Just from being on the ventilator, you run because you have a tube that's bypassing all your defenses. Like your saliva, your mouth, your, your nose, your nose hairs, all those things. And any and everything that you go straight down into your lungs. It's just dumped right in your lungs. And then people are accessing it to suction you out. Because obviously you can't swallow anymore. So we have to suction you. When you're on the ventilator. And look how and why God chose me. Why God chose me to use me in the way that he chose to use me. Based on who I am, where I've been. How he made me. And he'll use you based on who you are, where you've been, how he made you. Gifts, talents that you have, interests that you have. And I worked with ventilators. Who would have thought? Who would have thought as God was putting all this together? The devil can't coordinate things like God. He's no match for God. That's why he's got to keep you in your flesh. He's got to keep you in the lowest element. He's got to keep you full of hate, watching porn, watching trash, being lazy, being filthy. That's the only way he can deal with you. God don't deal in that stuff. So I'm telling the lady, what's going to happen is people, for all kinds of reasons, are going to have, be short of breath. They're going to go in the hospital. They're going to automatically assume you have COVID because that's what they do. That's what, that's what we do in the hospital. If there's something contagious going around, you get tested. They do a test for it. And then you go and they treat you as though you have it until they find out that you don't have it, which is called ruled out. But obviously, if you think someone has something deadly, you have to treat them as though they have it until you find out they don't. So they're going to do everything as though it's COVID. We're going to be aggressive. Put them on a vent. Blow their lungs out. I had a man speak to me the other day, maybe two weeks ago. And he said, well, the problem is this guy is a health, a health officer. A county health officer. Never worked with a ventilator probably a day in his life. Your doctor at your doctor's office doesn't work in the acute care setting. Probably hasn't done so since he was in medical school. Spent six weeks in the ICU as part of his medical training. So he, they, 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 medicine is very, very specialized. They know the area that they work in. So this health officer says, well, well, that's the problem. Uh, they're not getting them on the ventilator fast enough. They got to get them on there before they deteriorate. No, you got to support them so they don't deteriorate. Make sure they're not just frightened, anxious. And then he also told me, blacks are dying more than anyone. You know why? Because there's crappy health care at county hospitals. I've worked in them. I know. I watched my favorite uncle receive crappy health care in a county hospital when he was dying of cancer. And if I hadn't been there at his bedside, even more things would have happened. Not that anybody was maliciously doing anything, but when you work in an environment without accountability, because you're working with the poor and impoverished and the uneducated and people who are not advocated for. People who don't know the questions to ask. These are the things that happen. So I told her when they turn 5G on, 
We're hearing this all the time. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Remember that other guy? Who was that guy? The guy that was selling the cigarettes. That big dude who was selling illegal cigarettes and he got choked with a chokehold. He got like, I did see that video, but I didn't see this George video. I refuse to watch it. I already know the purpose of it. I'm guarding my heart. You're not going to set my neurons to front firing. I'm going to stay wrapped in the mind of Christ. Because I know I got one and only one obligation in this world. And if I fail at it, nothing else matters. And that is to make sure that I don't gain the whole world or even a few crumbs in it and lose myself. So I tell her, so they got, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. My hands are up. I got my hands up. These are all the, the triggers that rush you to conclusions and involve no thinking. They just set it, set it off and send it everywhere. So they've been forecasting this for years. I can't breathe. I thought about why are they messing with Chris Brown? Why are they messing with Chris Brown? You know who else they're messing with? Jordan Sparks. Because although they are trying to have one foot in the world and one foot in entertainment, in one one foot they want to be left alone and have their own convictions, and the other foot they want in the world to take advantage of the positive side of money, wealth, and celebrity. But there's a negative side too. That these people want to drag you into all your filth, and they want to cross your boundaries. They want you to do things like Cat Williams said that you're not prepared to do. And if you don't go along with it, then you're trashed. You're you're made to um, you're just belittled and so Jordan Sparks. She catches a lot of flack. She catches a lot of flack because she has a conscience. Now, if you little Wayne, if you little Wayne. And you are just demonic. If you Snoop Dogg and you just demonic. If you Miley Cyrus and you're just disgusting. If you Katy Perry and, and you enough to make somebody vomit. You Beyonce, you make somebody vomit. You're just willing to do just any old nasty thing the devil tell you to do. You're not going to have a problem. But if you're someone that refuses to eat babies, <laughs> and I'm not saying that everybody's presented with that thing, but the higher up folks go, they know what's going on. You don't want to drink blood. You don't want to do drugs. You don't want to, you know, you do this drug, but you don't want to do that drug. You start picking and choosing, uh, you know. They don't take too kindly to all that. So this is why Jordan Sparks and and people like uh, Chris Brown have trouble. Because they got, got a little, just enough independence in them that they just, it's not quite willing to go all the way along with the program. Limits and standards. But if you're of a certain age, and I mentioned Chris Brown, Jordan Sparks, and I Can't Breathe, that ought to brought a certain song to your mind. How are we supposed to breathe with no air? If they mess with our very air, 
How are we supposed to breathe? That's what's coming. And you know what they've set up over the last, uh, since October of 2019, when this first popped up in China, where they, where they implemented the 5G first? Um, in all the rest of the cases, they're just normal people. People die of respiratory failure. People die of respiratory infections. And anyone can die of mismanagement of a respiratory infection. If I just have a bronchitis and I go into, I've been sick enough where I went to the doctor to get antibiotics from, I think I had, a. I guess it was bronchitis one time. And I, I wasn't eating and I was really, really sick. And uh, my mother was like, look, you're going to the doctor. I'm taking you to the doctor because I wasn't getting better. And I was so sick that I, I thought I could die. I thought I was sick enough to die. So, um, no, that was a different time, but I, it was also a respiratory something. I don't know what I had because I didn't go to the doctor that time. But I was really sick. It was during the time when the Lord was drawing me. I wasn't saved, but my conscience, God was working on my conscience. I was changing. And I was at home. I lived by myself and I was at home and I was so sick. I was so sick. I didn't have a telephone. And I said to myself, I'm going to go over to my mother's house where everyone is. Because if I get so sick, if I get much sicker, they'll be able to see me and they'll call the doctor or they'll, you know, they'll be able to call 911. So I went over there and I got in a bed and I don't know how many days I stayed in that bed and I recovered. I don't even, I was so sick. I didn't even care what was wrong with me. I didn't eat. I didn't drink anything. And it just, it just healed. It just went away. My body fought it off. But I was also probably 29 maybe 30. So uh, then later on I was, uh, I got sick another time and I was really, really sick. Not as sick as that first time, but I was really, really, really sick. I wasn't able to do anything. And my mom said, you know, you're going to a doctor. And she like took me to the emergency room and she sat way across the room from me. And I was so sick, I'm sitting there like, <coughs> I'm coughing, got all this stuff in my lungs. Now, if I had pre if I present in, and I had a fever and all that, if I present in an ER today with those symptoms, they're going to hospitalize me and test me for COVID. And then they're going to tell you, oh, you know, you need to sign this form because you got to have permission to be, to be intubated. You need permission because it's a uh, uh, extraordinary measures and you need permission to treat and stuff like that. So you need permission and they also get monetary incentives for their COVID patients. And as you know, their business has been drastically reduced and they have a prescribed way that they have to treat COVID. They cannot look at their patient and react to what they see. They must follow the protocols for COVID, which kill people, which are dumb, which are not smart, which bypass all the doctor's so-called critical thinking. Treat your patient. Look at what's going on with your patient. They're not allowed to do anything because all the conclusions about COVID have already been drawn. And if you don't follow what is called the medical standard, you know, that's malpractice. Long as you follow the medical standard, it doesn't matter what happens to your, your patient. As long as it's what has come down as best evidence from we don't even know where this best evidence junk just fell out of the sky from dubious research. Some of it makes sense and some of it is utter nonsense. And we'd be in the hospital. Now, I never treated COVID because obviously I got out of that line of work because they were constantly 
uh, shoving vaccines at me and computers. And I spent 60% of my time doing dumb things in the computer while I ignored my patients or while I had to rush through the care that I gave for my patients because I spent as much time charting what I did as I did doing what I did. And since doing what you did doesn't trigger billing, but charting what you did triggers billing, that's where the emphasis is. And I was a very conscientious nurse. I'm not one that's just going to put in the computer that I did something that I didn't do. Now, most people are willing to cut those corners because it's really dumb stuff and just tell the computer you did it. Yeah, yeah, I did that, dummy. Most people are willing to do that, but I couldn't do it because you're lying. All liars are going to have their part in the, in the lake. So I reached this point where I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't have time to provide the level of care that was compatible with the conscience that God gave me and deal with this computer anymore. And on top of all of that and equal to it was that they were constantly trying to give me the flu shot. And as you guys know from my video, which I'll link about the video that I had a couple years ago, I think in 2017, maybe early 18, that I had about vaccines when I told the story about how before I even became a nurse, I was in nursing school and I had a dream that everybody was being forced to take flu shots and they were very dangerous. And this head nurse came up to me and she had this special box with this special syringe and I knew I was going to have to make a choice. Give up this career and have be saved or, or choose this vaccine or choose this syringe where I would do it myself and give it to other people. And I, I knew I was going to have to make that choice one day in this dream. She wasn't asking it of me then, but she was evil. I also had a dream one time where this man was saying Cleveland Clinic is a satanic organization. There are Satanists, witches, warlocks in medicine. Who else would come up with a procedure and get it legalized to rip babies out of their mother's body, healthy babies out of the bodies of healthy women? Nothing but child sacrifice. Where was I? Oh, that's why I got out of medicine. That's why I got out of health care. Uh -uh. I'm not devoting my life to that. It was once upon a time when I loved it. Because I love my patients. And, and in rolled this thing. They call it, they called it a cow. The computer on wheels. And then we got all politically correct and sensitive. You can't call it a cow anymore because all the fat ladies are offended. We had to call it a, uh, what did they start calling it? We didn't call it the cow anymore. They changed the name of it. Cleveland Clinic teaches communist propaganda to their employees. I got a, I got a videotape of it. I made a videotape while I was sitting in their um, orientation slash indoctrination session in 2017. I'll play it one day. I was outraged. I was outraged. It's interesting. I'll play it one day. Okay. So that's how they're killing people with COVID. With COVID. But when the 5G turns on, you won't be able to breathe. Jordan Sparks, Chris Brown, no air. I've never heard the song. I've never heard it. I had a relative that uh, we were doing the, like a, a little karaoke without the carry. We were just singing and recording it into the computer. Uh, back in about 2000. 13, I guess. 
and and they liked that song. They were in like eighth, ninth grade at that time, and that song was out and popular. And they, you know, she's all in love with Chris Brown and whatever. So um, this was before he got trashed in the media for defending himself against the the satanic worshiping cuckoo woman called Rihanna. Who tried to kill them in the car. And you know why I believe that? His side of the story. Why he hit her. Because she grabbed the wheel. I have been in the car with an idiot. Who in a fit of uh, lover's rage. Or whatever you want to call it. Tantrum. Grab the wheel while I'm driving. People do crazy stuff like that. And if I was a dude, see, I couldn't do anything because he was stronger than me. He reaches over, puts his foot on the gas. Grabbing the wheel. He even grabbed me by my hair and pulled my head under the dashboard. And you know what you don't do, Rihanna? Rihanna, you don't get back with them. That's what you don't do. That's what you don't do, Chris. When you have a crazy, something is deeply wrong with a person who does that. They're like a murderer. You're crazy. You don't care about your life, my life, no one's life. Anyway. So they got this song, Chris Brown. Jordan Sparks. So I remember her singing that song. No air, no air. How am I supposed to breathe with no air, no air? My niece was singing this. Oh, what kind of song is this? That sounds pretty depressing. Good Lord. Never thought anything else about it. Didn't even know who sung it. Didn't even know who sung it. And then it occurred to me this past week. No air. So I looked it up. And come to find out it was Chris Brown and Jordan Sparks, who the media hates, hates both of them. And we already know Chris Brown said, it's the end of the world. Which God gave me a dream back in 2015. I did not know who it was at the time, but it turned out to be Chris Brown with helicopters outside his house, being called crazy, being blah, 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 blah. Look how God, look what God is doing. He just wants us to understand. Look at all the trouble he's gone through, creating the world in such a way, organizing our lives, ordering our steps. Also, we will understand that we can trust him, that the gospel is life. It is the only thing that leads to life. We must reject everything else. We must reject. Obama because he rejects our God. When they offer him back, he's not a solution. He's not the answer. He's not the way. He's not the, the father. He's not God. He doesn't love you. They're making him seem like this wonderful family man who's never had any scandals with any women because he's gay. And the three men that accused him of it are all dead. So I'm talking to the lady today about Obama. Well, first we start talking about Trump. She can agree with all that. Oh, yeah, what a dirty dog. That orange orangutan. All kind of names. I think the conversation started off with Something was said, and I said, you know, that's racist. If a white person said that, you know, we have a big problem with that. They don't see the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the kernel that hides sin from you. Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. That's how you hide sin from yourself. 
when you ignore the beam and reach for the moat in other people's eyes. Black people say stuff just every bit as racist as white people. And all of it is not racist. Sometimes it's just stuff that you say because no one's really around. Who are you going to really offend? And some stuff is true. You know, sometimes people fit into stereotypes. The problem is when you when you're going to declare that all people that are that color always act that way and you hate them and you won't give that person a chance to not be that stereotype that you think they are. There's even a scripture in the Bible that that talks to you and cautions you about judging someone harshly and pouncing on, I think it's in Ecclesiastes somewhere, knowing that you yourself have made statements when no one was around or when they were in secret that if they were known abroad, you'd be, you'd be hung up on a tree for. I think it's something about have, how, you know, don't condemn your servant if you hear him curse you. Because you've even said things behind people's back that you wouldn't want them to know that you said. Every negative statement is not revealing the heart of a racist. Learn to discern the difference. Don't just lump everybody in the same bag. So I think that's how the conversation started. She said something that was very like, you know, white women always doing such and such. And I was like, why would you say something like that? You know, all white women don't do that. Well, yeah, I didn't mean that, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then somehow the conversation got on Trump, which I hate to hear these conversations. I hate to hear people who are crazy about him and I hate to hear these people who are caught up in the rhetoric that he's to blame for everything. He's just playing his role. He's just an actor. He's just an actor who's borrowed a bunch of money from international bankers. He's highly leveraged. He's got to play along. I bet you he regrets taking his job now. I bet you he regrets taking it now. Probably seemed like easy money at the time. He looks like he's under, or he will be under a lot of stress before it's all done. Because I dreamed he was going to leave office homeless and hated. He's going to be like um, Art Modell when he took the, the Cleveland Browns to Baltimore. His life was in danger in Cleveland. So, no problem, no problem talking about Trump. Okay, but they ain't not going to say nothing about Obama. I said, well, look at Obama. I said, he passed a law. He wrote, he signed a law. He, he signed a law into, he signed that decision into law to allow the abomination of homosexual marriages. He, he brought judgment on America, and we all went along with it. And you're going to choose your king, Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Well, yeah, I don't believe in it myself, but this is the government. That's different. Give Caesar what Caesar's. No, you need to part ways with Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Give us Barabbas. Hypocrisy is the leaven of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy is what allows people to run from guilt and to run from conviction. Because you just refuse to acknowledge what you're doing. You're just blind to it. You see everything everybody else is doing.
So I point that out and I said, you know, Obama, he, he's for abortion. How are you a Christian? No answers to any of those things. No answers to any of that stuff. Just doesn't matter. Trump, Trump, Trump. And I, okay, so I said, I, and I told you, I said, all this stuff is just meant to, I told her Trump was the rider on the, on the red horse that was sent to take peace from the earth. And what comes after him is, is death and hell. Power to kill a third of human beings. With war, famine, pestilence, and 5G. And he just, all in the midst of this pandemic, so-called, he just got to push through this law. We got to keep pushing for 5G. How is that important? But it's, it's, it's in law now. You got a mad rush for 5G. What? Nobody asked what's the hurry. Nobody asked what's the hurry. There's no demand for 5G, except for the people who want to control you with RFID chips. Who want to be able to send impulses through your brain that you won't be able to fight. You'll be taken over. You'll be mind controlled. I don't know about how it'll affect your DNA. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know that it will. I don't know. But I know it can, that they can use that to affect your brain. To stimulate electrical impulses, it's just plain physiology. So I told her, I reminded her, and I said, he's, he's the rider on the red horse. That's all Trump is. He's here to make everything look so bad that Obama actually looks good for the nothing that he did while he was president. Only thing he did was destroy the country. Spin us into ruin. Passed a bunch of abominations as laws. S circumvented the Congress to make the executive order the rule of the day. People don't know anything about the congressional process anymore to pass laws. Just president just do whatever he want to do. Because we've been in war and martial law and emergencies and all kind of stuff since the other fake event 9-11 and that's all these things are done for fear lick and control put you in fear and then they can control you because you stop thinking and your brain just starts firing while you're fed a steady diet of of uh, fear stimulating triggers I said that's all Trump is. He's just there to set the stage for people to override the Constitution and demand that this man who's, who's by law not supposed to be able to be president again to be president. To just suspend the Constitution the way they did in the French Revolution. And the people demanded it and it was to their own detriment. 85% of the people that were murdered with the guillotine in France during the French Revolution were not the elite that they were supposedly revolting against. We're not the mon the the um, what's it called the king monarchy. We're, we're not the monarchists and the royalists that were supposedly the um, target of all this outrage, it was the ordinary people that died. 85% of the ordinary people. You're going to fall victim to your own madness without the mind of Christ. So I told her, I said, you know, I've been told you. I said, why would I lie to you? Why would I lie to you? All this is done to set back up for Obama to come back. She said, well, we'll see. But we'll see if it happens. We'll see. 
I said, people want Obama back. She didn't say anything because she wants him back too. I saw, I heard her the other day watching a, watching an Obama speech. He'd come back, she'd jump all over it. They love him. You hear me? They love him. They love him and they trust him and they're not thinking. And they won't think because their brains are hijacked and they're controlled because they're under the spell of, of the Jewish mass media. Because there's a plot. to centralize power in the form of a global government. With a very tiny minority of the money creators, known as international bankers, that provide money to governments, that set up the central banks and banking systems of countries that have sent out debt and interest and usury to the point where they own everybody and they are owned, owed an unfathomable amount of money that already could never be paid back. And it definitely can't be paid back now that they've destroyed our economies. This thing is a done deal. As the French would say, a fait du complet. It was done in Norman Dodd's day. It was done at the Great Depression. It was done. He was told that these conflicting interests within the American system and the government were so uh, entrenched that they could never be resolved. All that was left was the conditioning of the American people because the government was already subverted by a foolproof method, the love of money, the hidden hand that pulls out the wallet and pays with a bribe. Lies and deception of the fork of their forked tongued father. And I wanted to show her. She called her, her, her friend called her. Right at that moment, her friend called on the phone. You know, when you talk on the phone, you're on a speaker. And I said, watch this. I said, hey, so-and-so. Um, Cause they're always talking about Trump. They're always talking about Trump. I said, if Obama, if Obama had a chance to come back and be president, would you vote for him? See, I, I didn't, I made it sound like I did, you know, I didn't care either way or I thought it was a good idea or whatever. And she said, oh, in a heartbeat. Oh, in a minute. And I said to the other woman, see, they were people wanting back. As they say, this is an idea whose time has come. The Constitution no longer serves us. We got to get rid of it. This calls for drastic, drastic times. Calls for call for drastic measures, and the that it's an idea whose time has come because they give you all your ideas. So of course they can tell you when the time has come. Last thing I'm going to read to you before I go, and I'm just going to read it just like it was. This is how you can tell a liar if they don't agree with this. Just like how you can tell an antichrist because they can't say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So this is how you can tell a liar in this truth game. And by truth gang, I'm talk game, I'm talking about. Uh, the the um, truther movement, truther movement, 
This is how you can tell the real from the fake. This is how you can tell the shills from the sincere people. And this is how you can tell the money-grubbing cowards from the people who really care about the freedom of their fellow man. I have to find this because I'm going to read it verbatim. please. This is important. Sorry, I wish I could uh, pause and edit this out. Okay. Can't believe this. This has to finish off this dream. It has to. Please, Lord, help me find this. It probably deserves to be its own dream. I mean, its own video. this time. Sorry if I had my voice low during this. Okay, here we go. Thank you for your patience. This was on June 4th, 2020. A dream. I was speaking to some people. I said, nobody wants to say that a group of Jewish people run the world along with some others that operate with them for advantage. And they determine everything that happens. Someone said that they had not wanted to see it before. All I can remember, all there was, that's the way it is, this is how you can Separate the truthers from the shields. If they won't say, just like, if they can't say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they're an Antichrist. If they can't say that the Jews are at the bottom of all of this with, with um, Zionism, 
and the the uh, magic silver bullet to shut everybody up is to call them an anti-Semite. They're a bunch of liars. And I'm going to name somebody. Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler was a, a Zionist defending shill. Told a lot of truth. And he also told some garbage. Tell me we're living in a digital simulation. God bless.